Thank you so much for being here, everyone. So fake news, no one's ever heard that phrase before. Um, fake news is one of those phrases that means so many things to so many different people, invoked by so many, including our president, that it's kind of lost all meaning. But if one thing is clear, the entire phenomenon around fake news, or whatever we'll call it in this conversation, is that there is a huge anxiety about what it means to have private actors be such a critical component of what is normally a public fun function, the idea of our public sphere. So I thought that I would look at some First Amendment theories to see if there's anything that they could tell us about how the public sphere is supposed to work. These three theories that I'll pick out have really been guiding lights for the last hundred years, and it's it would be interesting to see if they have anything to tell us about the fake news phenomenon and anything else that's happening online that we that challenges us challenges us in different ways. So, where's my SpongeBob? So normally, this is when people say the First Amendment, but the First Amendment has nothing to do with private platforms. It has everything to do with constraining governmental power. And as a doctrinal and legal matter, that's not wrong. But the thing with the First Amendment is that it has a cultural value that's beyond that. It means things to people, which is why if you tell someone that you don't like what they're saying, they're like, you're violating my First Amendment rights, even if you yourself are not the government. And so uh, I thought that was an interesting thing to explore, and then I came across a wonderful piece by Kate Klonick, who can't be here tonight, called uh, The New Governors. And in that, she really digs into the history of how First Amendment values, if not the law, are deeply embedded in the DNA of a lot of platforms, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and guide their governance. So the First Amendment does matter, not as a doctrinal matter, but as something that guides us and shapes our thinking. So then the question is, okay, if the First Amendment matters, what vision of the First Amendment actually matters? So here are the three theories that I mentioned. The first is my favorite First Amendment fairy tale called the marketplace of ideas. <laughs> There's probably no one in this room who hasn't heard that phrase before, and the reason I call it a fairy tale is because it has a principle at its heart, but very few practicalities about how it's supposed to work. So for those of you who might not have heard about it, it's a very American concept. Um, the marketplace of ideas says that we should not censor any idea because all ideas, good and bad, will enter this magical marketplace where somehow people will engage critically in them. The best ones will rise to the top somehow, and the bad ones will somehow fall by the wayside, and we'll, that's how progress happens, right? Now, here's the thing. With the marketplace of ideas concept, it was introduced into US Supreme Court jurisprudence in 1919. And at that time, not everyone held a microphone, certainly not people that looked like me. And so there was a lot less flooding the field. There's a lot less competing in that marketplace. So the marketplace of ideas concept doesn't have that much to tell us about what happens when there's so much speech, so many ideas. They're all sort of jamming at each other, and there's so many that they can't necessarily be heard. Also, you can just take refuge in one corner of the marketplace and not even engage in ideas that you might find critically challenging because there is so much, right? The, the concept, the marketplace of ideas concept doesn't even approach those ideas, doesn't grapple with them. So it seems to me that that might not be the most helpful guiding star when it comes to our current networked online public sphere. We can turn to the next uh, philosophy, which really focuses on the idea of personal autonomy. And in this theory of the First Amendment, the idea is we don't censor anybody because any articulation is somehow defining of one's own autonomy, and we don't want to shut that down because this is a free society and we should not shut down one's autonomy. I don't disagree. However, the philosophy doesn't embed any concept or even identify whether it's available to conclude that sometimes the articulation of one's liberty may impinge on someone else's, right? There's no relational concept within that. What happens when our freedoms bump up against one another? When someone speaking might be silencing someone else? Doesn't really tell us much about that. So that also feels like that might not be the most interesting concept or most uh, not a great guiding star, Though it does tell us something, it's a convenient concept if you want a lot of users to sign up for a platform, right? All of you speak your piece, all of you be part of our audience, we won't shut you down because everything you say is important. So you can see how it's, it might be functionally interesting for a particular end, but philosophically not necessarily instructive for all the things that we find challenging. The third is referred to as a collectivist or republican idea. 
And the idea here, uh, it's certainly the least popular, especially now, of the three concepts. But what it has meant, with a focus on democratic deliberation in particular, is that not all ideas need to be heard but the ideas that are important should be. So anything that is necessary for self-governance, we should have, that should be in the public sphere, and other things that are not good for governance, kick them out. Query, who decides that? But the, uh, the way that has been sort of embedded in American history is for some time, went away in the 1980s, there was something called the Fairness Doctrine. And what the Fairness Doctrine said was, if you held a broadcast license, it was incumbent upon you to introduce controversial concepts of public importance and show all sides. And so that's really the mechanism by which you start to say, okay, speakers matter, listeners matter, let's think of the whole system. So there is some benefit there that the system matters. However, the system matters only insofar as we care about political delib deliberation, which of course is not all of the internet, right? The internet has a lot more besides political discussion, even if it doesn't feel like it these days. <laughs> There's a lot more going on there. So that also seems like it has a shortcoming, right? Now the truth is that platforms have espoused variations of all three of these at different times. The marketplace of idea concept is a great talking point. Personal autonomy, very useful to get people to join and sign up for you. Thinking about engagement and listeners and what gets people coming back and giving them what they need, a helpful concept if you do want to engage in some sort of platform governance. But it's not clear that any one of them has coherently really taken hold and it's not clear that any of them is really helpful for us. So I thought, okay, well, if these three dominant philosophies of the First Amendment aren't really doing that much for us, maybe we can step back and, and sort of observationally look at what's going on in online speech and see if maybe there's a way to read those concepts into these theories and maybe that'll get us somewhere. So I write about these five different factors. For today's purposes, I just wanna pluck out a couple of things that I think would be interesting to talk about later. The first is the idea of filters. Now, there are manual filters, like things that you search or a hashtag that you might seek out that make sense of the vast swath of information that exists in the world online. There are also hidden filters, right? So hidden filters are receive a lot of attention in the discussion these days, but it's the algorithms that decide what to serve you, when and how. It's why I still have you know, Valentine's Day content on my Instagram, which I'm very annoyed about, but that's kind of what the hidden filter is. Um, it's important to remember that the filters are both, both the manual and the hidden filters are related and they evolve. And so a great example of that is a reporter at BuzzFeed, Ryan Broderick, decided about a year ago, maybe more than that, that he was gonna sign up uh, to follow the Republican National Convention's Facebook page. Then he decided that he would click on every suggested page that was surfaced after clicking on that page. After about two days, he was getting tons of neo-Nazi and white supremacist content, right? So the filter took him down a particular rabbit hole that did not lead him to puppies and cats. It led him to something very particular that somehow was associated with the RNC. So filters are important because they can guide you places. They can also make sense of everything that exists in the world. The second is communities. Now, one of the best things about the internet is that it allows people to organize around communities of interest that aren't necessarily only geographically bounded. So if you love polka dotted unicorns, even if no one in your school or your workplace or your religious institution shares that, you can go online, you can find someone else who cares about polka dotted unicorns too. That's a great thing, live your best self, go ahead. Now, critics of that have said, well, the problem is, right, that it can create these echo chambers, that you might be a person who only receives information about polka dotted unicorns, and that is a very narrow lens on the world. Um, and, and that's fine to critique sort of information consumption in that space. But one thing that I find interesting is that communities don't only consume information in community spaces. Communities also create the norms by which people decide what is relevant, what is credible, what what is true? What is enough evidence for us to find something useful or not? How does this fit into our worldview? And communities are really an interesting location for that conversation and those norms to be set. And I, so I'd want to focus on like sort of the, that value of community organization. Um, the third is amplification, which is really 
a fancy word for how do things from the fever swamp of the internet hopscotch their way onto my television. Uh, and I have a couple of examples in the piece, but I, I think what's important here is that social platforms play a really critical role because they open up the field of who can engineer what appears to be popular and what isn't. And so you can have people who decide to get a hashtag trending. Now a hashtag is trending in the world, fine. Maybe some other people say, oh, you know, I need something on my talk radio show, so I'm going to just pick up this trending hashtag, and then other people who decide to put it on you know, their television show that has a slightly bigger audience. And then it looks like, well, even more people are talking about this. Ultimately, the mainstream media picks it up. And all of a sudden, we're all having a conversation about whether or not our former president was born in Kenya. But this idea sort of originated from a very narrow slice, right? It's one thing to analyze that that happens, but another thing that I think is interesting about amplification is really that uh, what that means in light of the psychological research that tells us that familiarity can often operate as a proxy for truth, right? So if you hear something on talk radio driving to work, hear a snippet of it in the work break room, you hear something, you see something about it on your Facebook, and then you hear about it while you're cooking your dinner on, you know, on the news, that concept, you may say, well, I don't know if it's true or false, I haven't dug into it, but it might be true, right? People are talking about it, so it might have some credibility. And that amplification principle is really interesting for that reason. Um, the fourth principle, which is speed, uh, it's you know kind of tried to talk about how fast things are on the internet. So the only thing I'll say there is um, uh, social media allows for probably the best focus group testing that anyone could have ever created. You can try out memes and hashtags and other campaigns, other forms of persuasion, and see what works in a way that would have been far more laborious and expensive in any previous time. Trying that out also can create a lot of noise, right? A lot of like, a lot of distracting memes, a lot of distracting hashtags, a lot of content that's sort of out there in the world that is noisy. So speed also relates to the abundance of content that's out there. And the last one is profit incentives. Turns out you can make money on, uh, on pretty much anything if you, if, if you want to online. And so the profit incentive of uh, putting up content that might be cheap to make because you made it up or it's hyper-partisan or whatever creates an incentive to make things that aren't really that valuable as, as parts of speech. And so those are kind of the five factors of online speech that I was like, hmm, these are, these are interesting observations. However, none of the First Amendment theories that are available recognize or make visible these principles at all, right? They're just not, that's not a thing. And so to me, this is where, or this is where, you know, the SpongeBob SquarePants critics of the world might say, who cares if the theory talks about it, right? If you can identify that these are factors that contribute to an online public sphere that produces a lot of things that we don't like, then let's deal with those factors. It doesn't matter if the theory encompasses it or not. And that is where I would say. The theories matter so much because they really shape our imagination, both of what is possible, but also of what's relevant. I let, that's me. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I just wanted some music, you know, to build up why theories were important. So theories can help us decide what is and is not relevant. And so a great example of this and is just the idea, the bedrock idea of censorship, right, which so many of the First Amendment philosophies are organized around. In the traditional view of censorship, you don't ban anyone from speaking because their idea might not then be exposed to all the people who it should be exposed to. We don't get to engage with it. We don't get to really grapple with it. The harm there, right, what we're saying the harm is that people might not be exposed to ideas they should be exposed to. There's a scarcity logic that's there. However, in the modern public sphere, right, because there is so much, you still might not be exposed to all the things that you should be able to see. And Zainab Tufetje makes this point brilliantly uh, in Twitter and Tear Gas and other writings that she's had, which is that uh, the abundance of content also ends up shaking out looking like censorship because it prevents people from being exposed to ideas that they should be exposed to because there's just so much it can't be heard. It's too noisy. And so if we think about how this concept really changes in the modern public sphere, we all of a sudden realize that this organizing principle that theories are organized around 
don't play out the way that we think they should, and maybe that means something, right? Maybe we need to rethink this. The other reason that theory matters is that theories, especially like the marketplace of ideas, get weaponized, right? We have Dennis Prager and Chuck Johnson suing YouTube and Twitter, respectively, saying you can't filter our content or you can't put tags on our content, you can't ban us, because the marketplace of ideas guarantees that we have a right to be here. And that is, if you have that concept, only that concept available to you, maybe there's some credibility to that argument, but it's just not clear to me that that theory is the right one. Now, I'm not saying that we throw out the marketplace of ideas concept. Maybe we do. But I think it's worth it to think in this sphere of whether that encapsulates everything we want it to, or whether there's other ideas or other metaphors that better describe what we're dealing with. Maybe it's a field where we let weeds grow, but we stop before the kudzu vine like poisons the soil so nothing grows anymore. Maybe it's a thunderdome, which is what the internet feels like these days. Maybe it's something else. But I do think that we need to know a lot more about how speech works online before we decide that. And I'm very lucky to be on this panel with two people who think about it more than any Anybody. So thanks so much, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you guys. Thank you. Um, I always appreciate a master class in First Amendment <laughs> theory. Um, and so I am going to introduce, my name is Joan Donovan. I'm the uh, Data and Society Media Manipulation Research Lead. And there are many wonderful researchers in the crowd here that I work with. And so a lot of the things that I'm going to say and questions I'm going to ask are going to be thoughts that we've collectively come up with. Um, and it's just been a really uh, uh, enormous pleasure to be able to work with such an amazing group of folk and then also be networked with Claire Wardle, who is president, CEO, what is this title you have at First Draft? Number one, just number one at First Draft. Um, and she's, she's kind of a jack of all trades over at First Draft. And what they do is they really think about how disinformation um, impacts journalism and how journalists are coping with these new spheres of information, especially in moments where they are um, under attack. And there's so much false information out there and how profitable that stuff is. And so First Draft is really uh, one of uh, a line of defense for journalists. And so um, I was going to introduce you by saying that you were the person who invented the, the conspiracy theory about fluoride and making the frogs gay. <laughs> but um, I feel like people can ask her about that later in her early days online. Yeah, we should all share our the, yeah, the things that the, we the conspiracy started. theories yeah. that we started. Um, I like it. Yeah, that was a good one. I, re <laughs> I really appreciated it. Uh, so Claire is going to tell us a little bit about first draft, and uh, maybe you're probably going to try to walk back some of the things that I said about that. But that wasn't disinformation. I really appreciate the work that you do. Thanks, Joan, and thanks very much for having me. Um, God, you're a smarty pants. Um, but it's so useful because I'm currently on an EU Commission high-level expert group uh, on this topic. And it's so fascinating to be in a European context and to hear the way they talk about the First Amendment and their perceptions of the First Amendment and this kind of very simplistic mm -hmm. mechanism as we're here in Europe, we're the only people that can bring down these platforms because we don't have this very basic idea about speech. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited about doing this. And also we don't have enough lawyers on these panels. So um, so I'm just very quickly, oh look, you had another slide. I'm gonna talk just um, about First Draft for a second. Uh, some of you know us, some of us don't. Uh, we were founded two and a half years ago as verification specialists. So people who were forensically analyzing videos from Syria where you don't have anybody on the ground. Like what metadata can you examine? How can you make sense of information online from unofficial sources? And I'm gonna just show you this for a second. This is uh, taken from something that was created by Alexios Mansalis from Pointer and the International Fact-Checking Network. Because lots of people t talk at the moment about fact-checking. Uh, I think it's worth thinking through. Fact-checking actually evolved as a way of authenticating official sources online. So, or not even online actually, what, what have politicians said? Verification is very much about how you authenticate authenticate unofficial sources. Right now, we're in the middle of that Venn diagram. And so actually, these two communities, which were quite separate, are having to think about how we work together. And as we have platforms working with fact checkers to think through how you make sense of this and how you flag that to users or not flag, um, these two worlds are actually really interesting. And during the UK election, we worked with a fact checking organization to test whether verification experts should be working with um, fact checkers. And the answer is yes, because you know this, but it's all memes all the time. <laughs> and so as a 
a verification expert, I can do a forensic analysis of the image and I can make sense of the digital footprint of the person who started that. Did it come from a bot network? But when it's a meme about Theresa May's fox hunting record, because we fox hunt in my country, uh, I don't know Theresa May's fox hunting record. So I could go over to the fact checkers who are like, let me just check my database. Uh, and so actually a lot of this is how do we bring these different skills together? So we have over 100 partners globally trying to work together on this challenge, really believing, and we all believe this, which it has to be multi-stakeholder. It has to involve the technology companies and academics and human rights experts and uh, journalism organizations. So we've been trying to build this network together to say none of us are going to solve this alone. Um, but this is what I want to stress is we haven't really got a clue what we're doing. The lack of an evidentiary foundation for this conversation is shocking. And what we see globally is regulators, sorry regulators, but who really haven't got a clue coming up with legislation now that is dangerous with the lack of evidence that we have about the scale of this problem and the impact of this scale. So particularly in Europe, very well-meaning legislators in Germany and UK and the EU are coming from a particular Western democratic space and are going to create a blueprint that will be picked up and used in exactly the same way in Indonesia and Singapore and Brazil. And so this question of different jurisdictions, and I know Data and Society are doing work on it, it's so crucial, is how do we think about this uh, when every different cultural context is so different? And also I'll say this, and I love America, God bless America. But the conversation <laughs> is so. This is not an application process Shh, for your I visa. Got my green card okay. yet. But I know that this is like, I do love you know, America. you were going to put this on your. Yeah, I know what you're doing here. <laughs> Um, but the conversation is about political disinformation and it's about the Facebook news feed. This is actually about health and science disinformation on closed messaging apps around the world. And so how can we understand the global scale of this problem and think through how we, how we start thinking about interventions, not solutions, there's no one solution, when these platforms are global and tell us the story that they're global and there needs to be one standard globally. How does this work? And this complexity is greater than we even want to start thinking about. So, the reason I said that preamble was to say, because we haven't got a clue what we're doing, at first draft, what we try to say is, how can we try things in the field and then test them with rigorous research methods as a basis for building best practices for journalists? Um, because there's a big element here that most of the research, and we know this, have been done by political communication scholars. Most of it is in labs with American undergraduates. Great, happy that we have that, should not be the basis of all of our knowledge in this space. So what we try to do is do projects in the field and test them and then build um, resources. So we, in 2017, worked on uh, four projects. Uh, actually, election now was in the 2016 with ProPublica, cross-check in France, and then in the UK election in Germany. And the idea is, how can collaboration work? Exactly as you were saying, Nabir, we the vulnerability that the news industry has when they are absolutely determined to work separately, and rather than, as we know from the psychology literature, what works is familiarity and repetition. So when we've got one side just throwing out, let's think about 2016, Benghazi emails, Benghazi emails, Benghazi emails, and on the other side, well, there's a number of different ways we can think about this issue. And I'm not saying that journalists, and this is another thing we need to think about, what's the role of journalists in this space? You know, I don't think journalists should be operating psyops campaigns, um, but for me, there's a boundary for what journalists can and cannot do. Where does the State Department step in? And when does the Intelligence Committee and mm -hmm community mm -hmm. step, you know, and I don't think we're very good at having those conversations about boundaries when it comes to funding, when it comes to what we can do and what we shouldn't be doing, who should we be working with and not working with, and I think that's again as a field we need to talk about it. Um, but we're very much about can collaboration work. So in France, in the lead up to the French election, we had 10 weeks where we had 37 different organizations in France working collaboratively to monitor and verify disinformation around that election and then publishing it, the same stories on all of their platforms, which has interesting questions going back to your familiarity question, which is if you see the same things on Le Monde and Liberation and France Van Cat, and you're like, oh, I think I've heard that somewhere before. And that's, but should we be doing that as journalists? What are the moral questions and ethical questions about that? So there's a whole host of things that by doing these projects uh, we raise. So we're going to be doing something similar around the 2018 election, which is kind of terrifying because the French journalists were one thing, but trying to think about how collaboration might work in the US is going to raise a whole host of different issues. Um, 
so uh, we've undertaken research. This was qualitative research we did with the journalists and audiences around Crosscheck. And what was interesting with Crosscheck is when the stories were published, all the different news organizations that had worked together had to put their logos on. So from an audience perspective, you saw that different newsrooms that never normally worked together had collaboratively verified a piece of content. And from our research, it showed that that increased trust in the output. So what would it look like if you actually had Fox News next to CNN? I mean, that's what we're never going to be able to do it here. <laughs> We might. Um, uh, and then we have a, tr a training program. So if you are interested in this, we have a five-week advanced curriculum in verification. We're pushing that out to schools and journalists. So a big part of this is how can we work with newsrooms to improve what they're doing. Um, we also have some jobs listings, if anybody's interested. <laughs> Come see me afterwards. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say. I appreciate that. Thank you. And the work that you do is really oh, informative. No need for a clap. <laughs> Just a dainty one. Yeah, just a little one. Um, so maybe we can think a little bit philosophically. One of the things that um, came out of the report that uh, we just did with Data and Society with Robin Kaplan and Lauren Hansen were authors on that report um, about, we're, we called it dead reckoning because we really feel like we're at a point where we're sort of lost at sea and the moment is now to take stock and to think about what are directions forward. And one of the things that we kept discussing and kept churning back and forth is that we're getting better and better at thinking about what is fake news and what is disinformation, but nobody's really coming at this from a question of what counts as news these days. A lot of these platforms are trafficking in information and monetizing information, and then any information that can be monetized somehow becomes news <laughs> in some way, or it becomes um, useful in other, in, in other realms. And so I'd love for you to think about um, what maybe some of this modeling that you're working with, Nabia, would indicate for how would news then be moderated, not just disinformation or fake news or free speech? It's a great question. And I think that um, this is one of the many places where the very American approach to this question has totally failed us. And so um, New York's actually a great example. So newsworthiness can be a defense in a variety of, of media law claims. And it's most commonly a defense when there's an invasion of privacy question. And so that means that we actually have a body of jurisprudence about what constitutes newsworthiness and what doesn't. However, Basically, the way the case law has, uh, has unfolded is that everything is newsworthy, including Borat. So the people who were filmed in Borat who thought that they were being interviewed for a news show in Kazakhstan and found out that like, no, that's not, that's not what was happening. They were, <laughs> that's not what was happening Borat at all. Uh, and then saw themselves for the first time when they were sitting and watching this movie saying, oh my God, this, what is going on? Uh, they, they sued on invasion of privacy grounds alongside others. And, and courts looked at the newsworthy defense, which is the defense against invasion of privacy, and said, no, 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 Borat's newsworthy. Right, so if we like live in a universe where Borat is considered newsworthy, where like, pretty much everything falls in, in, the, in newsworthiness or defined as news, we don't really have a lot of good tools legally, which means that that is not gonna be the space that provides us these standards, even though so much of the conversation about First Amendment and free speech in this, in this country is like very legally influenced, right? There's a, there's a whole, I mean, or maybe, you know, when you hold a hammer, everything looks like a nail and it, looks, it seems really legal to me. And so I think we're gonna have to create this out of whole cloth. And I think there's a, I think it's just a really big problem. Like I don't even know how you begin to say, this is news and this is entertainment because the line has really blurred so much. Do you remember that argument about, are you a blogger? Or you, do you remember that argument? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think what's so interesting is actually, in terms of other professions, you have to have accreditation if you're a doctor before I do heart surgery on you, or if I'm a lawyer. And with journalists, it was like, we don't need accreditation because everybody can be a journalist. Mm -hmm. But now you're like, I want people to know that I'm really a journalist. <laughs> and so I do think this gatekeeper issue, like it feel, like you ask that question, I'm like, Ooh. like I don't, <laughs> like what, what is this thing? And ultimately the platforms have taken what our understanding of news. I mean like, we're gonna call it newsfeed. Mm -hmm. And what newsfeed is, is the fact that your friend's hung over and your other friend is pregnant. <laughs> and there's a terrible conflict in Syria. And so they have managed in the last decade to completely pull apart 
what we feel about news. And so then the question is, do we want to get back to this idea of we want the gatekeepers? And so things like the trust project that Sally Lehman's working on, do we want to have a big T on certain things to be like, there's your accreditation, you're really news, and you're really not news. Like that feels really uncomfortable to me, mm -hmm. but I don't know how we get out of this mess because of the cesspool. Yeah, and in, in this it c comes to a lot of the research that I've been doing around what counts as professional and amateur journalism. I've been watching and tracking different live streamers for the past, um, since 2011, and some of them have really been able to iterate on their style. And, ha and the way that they use digital tools and fashion themselves as journalists, even when they're not um, employed by or networked, seems to fit into also this other really important thing that's been happening, which is the fracturing of work, right? And so a lot of people are doing a lot of freelance labor. And so it's it's the tools that have been spread across, you know, everybody's got tools for journalism now in their pockets, right? Every phone is, is, is a tool that you could use to do interviews or to take video, right? Or to cut that video together. But then also we see the fracturing of a, a, a labor force and you see a few very, very prestigious news organizations who were somehow troubled by fake news in a weird way. Maybe you can explain more of that. But then also we have this problem now where we can't define news and of course, yeah, everything becomes begins to count as breaking, you know, I'm having dinner <laughs> in these news feeds. So if you guys want to talk a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see newsrooms now desperately want, wanting to find a way that says we're not like them. Um, but we also have to have this conversation, which is the reason that I refuse to use the term F asterisk 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 news is because lots of audience research now, you have audiences saying, yeah, that's CNN. Like it's working. Like people think that when you use that term, it means mistakes by reporters. And so what we also have to recognize is that in an era where newsrooms have been stripped of staff and have had their resources completely taken away from them, and as we know, the economics of news has completely shifted and two big platforms are taking most of their advertising profit. In that context, we're having newsrooms making more mistakes, mm. understandably, because of speed and the fact that a scoop last two seconds once somebody has tweeted it. So the other problem in all of this discussion is it's very easy for the journalist to say, all we have to do is stop those guys over there. And it's like, but how do we also make sure that we're building trust in what you're doing? And so whilst Crosscheck was far from perfect, it was just an attempt, I was kind of staggered by the way that audiences, well, two things, audiences said they were more trusting of the content. The other thing is the French journalist said, I hated it because we were forced to slow down because we had to get agreement from other newsrooms. But you know what we're really proud of now? Now that we're finished, we didn't make one mistake in 10 weeks mm. across all the major French outlets. And they said we would have made a bunch of mistakes if we weren't in this project. So we also have to find mechanisms that means that every time the news media, well, you know, this makes a mistake now, it's held up as mm. this huge thing. We, well, there's no opportunity now to make mistakes. I also wonder how much of this just has to be, and I know this is hard for all the reasons that you laid out, it has to be a race to the top in some way of saying, like, these are our standards and also being radically transparent about what it means to show your work of going into a story, right? Because I think the idea that people are just going to trust you because you're the news, because you're CNN, or because you're whoever, that time, you can't rely on that, right? So you're going to have to rely on your methodology. You're going to have to say, well, we talked to 18 people, and we did this, and here's a video like bringing you in. And I think if you pay attention to a lot of investigative reports, you're seeing more and more of that, right? We, we spoke to 200 people, and they said X. And some of that is just the only, or the easiest available way of saying, here's why you should trust us, here's the work that it takes. Now, it's incredibly uncomfortable for reporters to do. I talk to them all the time to really pull back the curtain of this is exactly what we did, but I think that might be one avenue to just getting some more trust, bringing people into the process so it's less vulnerable to the accusations of like, oh, they just made it up, right? They just like pulled this out of nowhere and they made it up. But it's, it is moving towards a different form or understanding of journalism and less like Oz speaking from behind the curtain, giving like editorial direction and saying like, we're people, this is what we do, this is how this happens. Some of it I think is a funny historical hangover too of like for a very long time, 
not that many people had access to the printing press, right? So we didn't really have to ask these questions because the people who had power aligned with who was able to print. Sure, there were, there were pamphlets and other forms of news that were sort of more localized, but for mass communications and broadcast, there was a, a sort of a coordination with power that was there. It's not like that anymore. So who, having access to the means of putting out the news is not going to do it, and we have to move away from that mindset. I think that's a really good point, and it makes me uh, actually feel a little bit more hopeful for the kinds of amateur journalism that I tend, I tend to take in a lot of that. Um, so this is people that are doing things in their neighborhoods or filming protests, and maybe they're not um, doing news all the time, but they see an opportunity and they go and they, they know there's a contentious city hall coming up, and so they'll use um, um, you know Periscope to, to, to broadcast it to the world. And I found that 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 kind of journalism, which is on the spot, is also, I think, really important for us to think about in terms of not over-moderating, right? Not overdoing it. When we were talking about some of these laws that might come down um, related to regulating this problem has a lot to do with the speed, but also has a lot to do with power. They, politicians know that they're implicated in this. L lots of the disinformation that you and I are going to be working with over the next few months is going to be about election campaign disinformation. And one of the things that um, who, who do this kind of disinformation work, trolls online, we can just kind of leave it as a blanket trolls, um, they, they really um, harness the power of speed and they harness the power of breaking news events in order to piggyback their ideas. And I wonder if you guys uh, would be interested in talking a bit about speed and democracy. Because you mentioned that slowing down the newsroom made for less mistakes. And I know from being a, a, a reader of Tocqueville that democracy is meant to move very slow. It's supposed to be very bureaucratic. It's not supposed to be very flexible. And that's so that you get um, theories of democracy. That's, that's so you get theories in law that are durable over the long term and don't just deal with these one, one issue, one problem. And so. Um, and this is going to be my last question, and we'll open it to Q&A, but if you want to talk a bit about speed and, and maybe the Silicon Valley ethic of move fast, break shit, might be anti-democratic. <laughs> might. <laughs> you notice how I don't have to answer that question. Yeah, I was gonna, <laughs> it's like Joan Donovan. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think like the slow food movement Maybe we're going to have the slow information movement. I mean, I think in the last 10 years, we've seen the death of the middle. Like, we've seen the death of this, you know, 800-word article. I mean, this actually happened. I remember the London riots in the summer of 2011. I remember thinking, I wasn't seeing anything from, like, the BBC News coverage that was interesting. I was getting everything useful from Twitter. And then at the weekend, I was having the 4,000-word piece about why the riots happened and why it mattered. And I was like... Yes, this stuff is gone. And we've seen that play out now, like long form journalism, investment journalism is really on the rise. And we've seen the people who are excellent during breaking news and like Buzzfeed are the leaders in like shutting down stuff very quickly and rumors and have made it, they're the best in the business of saying, don't get caught out, this hoax is moving, like actually informing the whole news industry. So we've got best practices there. So. So I'm not saying this won't go away because as humans we're like, <laughs> like that, we can't stop. Like we all know during a breaking news event, we're scrolling like crazy people. And I wish we could stop that. a lot of notifications. Yeah, that's why I have it turned over. But like, I wish, we, I wish there was a pill that made us, not a red pill, I wish there was a pill that made us like not have that emotional reaction to information, but we do. And that's why we're in the mess that we're in and the absence of a discussion about emotion and how these architect, you know, these algorithms have been architected to respond to that is, is the problem. So the slow thing, yes, 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 yes. How do we do it? I think we're in a period of, of recalibrating, and that doesn't mean that there won't be the people who provide like intellectual Doritos, which is what a lot of this is. Like, I think that that will be there, but I do think that we're in this funny mode. Like, Twitter's not that old. This sort of mode of like getting push alerts and everyone like Pavlovian looking at their phone being like, did you see this push alert? Which is a very weird social phenomenon. Like I, I think that we actually are sort of weirdly recalibrating that. What I don't want to lose, and another T Tocqueville point, is um, experimentation is also part of democracy, right? So yes, it's slow, but we're also meant to experiment with things. Right now we have a funny mix of like experimenting and being very fast, and that does lead to a lot of 
dropped eggs. And so uh, I think I think we're figuring out how to recalibrate that. I am. I mean, I have nothing to do with what our brilliant uh, niece curation folks do, but I think they're very good at saying, okay, that's getting legs. Shut that down. However, let's work on this slightly longer piece because we do see that people do click on those. People do share those. They actually do quite well. So there is a demand for those things. We just have to you know, listen to the better angels of ourselves and actually take time to create it, which is hard when you're in the emotional feedback of wanting to put out the, you know, 240 word hits. Dana's prerogative. You're also the only hand up, so. So it's interesting to listen to you guys talk through this, because one of the things that I've been struggling with as I hear these questions of trust in news media is that the institutions and the people can be trusted on their own terms, even when people are physically and network-wise divorced or really far removed from the creators. And that's one of the other things when we go back to Tocqueville, when your representatives are too far removed, you actually don't feel an investment in democracy. And I feel as though there's not an investment in news, because for most people, you don't know anyone who even knows anyone who works in the news. So the thing that I struggle with as I hear what you're talking about and the way you're pivoting it is that for me, what's at stake right now is not whether or not something is factual, but what is the epistemological frame, which is to say that what is the way of knowing and the way in which that's constructed that is acceptable. So as an academic, we fight obsessively over method to the point where I swear we tear each other to, to shreds. And so one of the things is that journalism has its own idea of what is acceptable method and tries to articulate it, but that's not the public's method, mm -hmm. right? And so in many ways, what journalism does is try to say, this is the way you should know. And when you start at that place, when most people are so divorced from it, I feel like the gut reaction is like, like hell you're gonna tell me what I should know. Mm -hmm. So how do we get back to a place where people are willing to even be open to the methods of journalism and the production of knowledge that you guys take dear? Because I'm not convinced that we're close to that place right now. I, I, that's, it's an excellent question, right? And in some ways, what we're, the gap we're trying to fill is that when there was local news, Right when you did, in fact, have like this like local yokel journalist showing up and like being at your you know PTA meeting or whatever, there was actually a person you knew. So there was a person in whom you could invest your trust or your disdain or whatever, but they were tangible to you. That is a thing that we have lost in the American context. Right, we don't have that person in every small town, and we're losing that. And it goes to the economics questions that you rightfully pointed out. And to me, the question really is like, how do we? I don't know how you replace that. One. There's, there's like a chicken and egg thing, right, of, you know, there's a lot of people, many amateur journalists, people who end up coming to eventually people to BuzzFeed too, who have great followers, who've developed and cultivated followers of their own, somehow managing to create that kind of community outside of the institu institutional structure, right? There's just, there's people during breaking news events where you're like, everyone's following this person because this person happens to be in the airport when the Atlanta airport is shut down and they're giving us all this information. And I think we have to be better about figuring out, first, one, being honest with how people allocate trust. And there is a personal element to that. It's not just about loving an institution. It's, a, it's about something tangible and recognizable and familiar. And then figuring out Okay, how do we identify who those people are? How do, do we team them up in institutions? How does this landscape work when it really, we have to think about trust, not as a, the institution tells you what you must know, but here are people you like and trust and you know, which we had, right? Which we had for a very long time. It just was aligned with the institution in a way that it was not visible. And now it's not aligned and we have to just talk about that, I think. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I actually worry that we, we're never gonna get back to that port, that we've lost trust. And the disinformation agents, we all know this, but it's not about individual falsehoods or rumors, it's about making people not trust anything. And so the point that we're at now is that increasingly large swathes of the population just don't trust what we would say is as mainstream news. And the kind of conversations we have at journalism conferences, if we actually had them with audiences, they would laugh at us and walk out after the first 10 minutes. I mean, the kind of conversations we have are ridiculous and they're about protecting 
protecting our own boundaries and why we're the only people that can tell these stories, blah, 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 blah. The thing with the internet now is that you can go and get information from whoever you trust, which increasingly, I mean, that word itself is problematic, but it's people that you think have got your best interests at heart. Now, if we can quickly talk about Facebook for a second, Facebook got us all to a point where we stopped going to individual web news websites every day. We increasingly went to our streams for that information and the algorithms learn. And for somebody like me as a news junkie, my Facebook was full of news. Not so much now, because they've changed the algorithm. They're like, we're now just going to go back to friends and family. Sorry, we changed all of your behavior. We can't get you back to look at those websites. So now we're just going to give you more of that like local news feed stuff that's not local news holding your power, powerful to account. It might be your local neighborhood group that's talking about the fact that the power light is down, but that's not good either. So I, I honestly, uh, I don't think we can get back to where we were before. I worry that the platforms have now taken it out of our feeds and are pretending that it's being replaced by local and relevant content, but it's relevant about your friends and family. But that fits into the fact that we have been Disinformation agents are saying you can't, you know, are making us think we don't know who to trust anymore. You're going to increasingly turn to your friends and family, and that's that's what really worries me. Yeah, and I, I will just add that this this really, uh, you know, a lot of our research focuses on these broken distribution channels and then how those distribution channels are gamed and um, used to set agendas, right? So it's not always about the content. Sometimes the content is just recontextualized and served through these different spider webs of information. And the goal in many instances isn't a, is about conf confusion, about chaos, about the lulls. And, and, you know, and you do earn a reputation in these alternative media spaces when you can get bad information par parroted back to the you know larger american public and that that to me that that trolly lulzy use of the distribution system is what facebook was trying to solve for but in the end you get this over impact over moderation that then makes it difficult for you to get the stuff that you had wanted to preference in the first place speaking of trust uh I have been entrusted with educating a group of low socioeconomic status people of color this semester who are very eager digital sociologists. Um, and we read Whitney Phillips and we've been talking about trolls and fake news and all of this stuff. And then I had a librarian come in because they're trying to learn to be sociologists. And we did an exercise on um, how to use the library databases. Mm -hmm. And I was really shocked because they were like, well, how do we know this is true? How do we know we can trust this? It was the library for our university but they couldn't get their heads around the fact that it was on the computer, so it must not be true. And so I was wondering if you had any words of wisdom that you could share, or I could talk to you later about resources I could share with them to help them. Mm. Yeah, I, well, that's an interesting thing. There's, uh, there's stuff to be learned by, uh, from Sophia Noble's new book, Algorithms of Oppression, where she tackles some of this uh, specifically in terms of even um, bad content does end up in libraries, but it's about engaging students with a critical media literacy and also knowing that, um, you know, the library is there to, as a form and function of giving you information and then talking with the librarian about what it means to have an article that's 10 years old, right, versus something that was, was published last year. And so uh, keep engaging with them and uh, have them think a lot about, you know, that the library was what the internet was modeled on in the first place. Some of the very first instantiations of what we would use the internet for was a wide area information system where we would network libraries and that content. And so part of the earlier visioning of what it meant to internet was to share and spread knowledge. And I think we've really lost that. Um, that I, I'm sounding very nostalgic. I'll shut up. <laughs> There's actually a great piece by Michael Colfield that I tweeted over the weekend uh, where he's actually, he, do, he does a lot of this. And he kind of gets annoyed at the media literacy. Here's the 10 top tips. And he's saying he's seeing the same trends. It's like we have to think completely differently about the way that we, we do this education. And Dan and I you know, wrote a great piece last year about the, you know, have we, back, is this backfired? Because we were so busy telling them they can't trust Wikipedia that we've lost it. And so it goes to this question of we've lost trust in everything. But Mike Colfield is really excellent on this. He's at Holden on Twitter. He's very thoughtful. So... Yeah. So implicit in a lot of this conversation when we talk about journalism is that it's 
print journalism, right, or the web analog of print journalism and web native publications that are dealing mostly in text. But of course, a huge percentage of people, when they're consuming news, they're consuming it on television or they're consuming television via the social web. And the, the whole production process for television news or just television on news channels um, is completely different. You know, there's been a lot of con a lot of worry and conversation about the loss of jobs for copy editors and fact checkers in you know newspapers. But I think there's there's been very little conversation about the sort of process of the putting together of cable television news and and especially very little focus on bookers who in many cases are basically serving the function of implicit writer and editor and are putting people on the television with no fact checking and then that becomes but it gets the imprimatur of well it's news now um, and so I, I want to hear a little bit about how can we how can we think about incorporating the production processes maybe showing it, verifying it, I, I don't know, but it, there are these very different production processes that, that end up muddying the water substantially and it's concerning to me. Um, yeah, very quick, could not agree more. This conversation ignores TV and it's the way that most people still get their information. As a European, ju just need to regulate broadcasting. I mean, you know, in my country, television broadcasting is regulated. And somebody I know who's the editor of Channel 4 News said, I used to hate the regulator until I became the editor of my program because it forced me every night to know that if I made a mistake, I had to, there was a fine and I have to go on television and apologize to my viewers. And it kind of seems crazy and quaint to sit in America and say that. But I, you know, I do agree with you that the power is in, in immense. The speed is a real issue. The bookers are also issues. And we don't talk about it enough at all. So I haven't really got an answer just to say, please say that more frequently. I'm also like nodding my head as you're talking. The only other piece I'd say is what's interesting about television, right, is in some ways this is a person who appears in your home who, by virtue of doing so, has the familiarity of a person that you know, but you don't know them at all. You don't know them when they're on The Apprentice, and you don't know them when they're on your Fox News show. Um, and, and so it's sort of funny because it gets all the, the trustiness that we've talked about in this different context, but not necessarily the same production standards that one might want of investigative journalism, and there just needs to be more of a norms transfer, uh, because I think we have approached, again, fairly recently, the regulation of like sort of, you know, there's this weird division of ca how cable is treated and how, uh, you know, other broadcast television is treated. Um, but that's also like a lot of this is, in the grand scheme of things, sort of new for us. And I think the sort of norms transfer of how this is supposed to work is slow and showing the demand for it is important. So yes, keep having this conversation with everyone who'll listen. I have a question around the news sources that you were talking about with First Draft. Because in the US context, spe specifically in local elections, very um, ethnic media has a huge impact on how people vote. And um, if we look at who are turning the house, who are turning state houses, in the US, it tends to be populations of color, particularly black women. But when you talked about Le Monde and you talked about some of these other news sources, those newsrooms, I was wondering, number one, whether you were looking at ethnic media, because people from those communities may not trust Le Monde or The Times or wherever. And my second question is really around, why is it that we're not getting misinformation from those newsrooms? Yeah, brilliant question, partly because you've got a lovely accent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, it, this is what, thank you for pushing me on this. One of the reasons that CrossCheck worked is that we had uh, national but also regional and local newsrooms. And because of that, it brought in people who normally wouldn't trust the Parisian press. But this is me being very honest for a second. Uh, we had a press conference to launch this. And we were like, da-da, look at all our logos. And uh, somebody came up to us and just said, uh, hi, I'm from Safir Media. We're a Muslim community newspaper. Uh, why are we not here? And we were like... Oh, this is singly one of the most embarrassing moments. Uh, and yes, please join us. And they were amazing. And for us, it was that we were so proud of having like local and regional, and we just had completely ignored community ethnic media. And for me, it was a moment I will never forget. And my work has been changed because of just that that one moment. Even though I knew it, I go to conferences, I think about it, I read about it. But that moment was like, holy shit, Claire! Like, what the hell are you doing? And for in the U.S. context, for us, it's going to be all about connecting with the community and ethnic media. But it goes exactly to trust and not to rehash these conversations. But we know one of the main 
main reasons the mainstream media is not trusted is because mostly it's white and middle class. Uh, and so many communities are just like, I see no, none of my community represented in these stories, let alone the newsrooms. The when the journalists come into my community, they have no way of understanding how I can talk. Um, and we worked with Nick O'Malley in the Assurance Center who used to work at the LA Times. He said there was a day when there was a, there was a big festival in LA Times, you know, and so he, the whole community was out for a, for a big Hispanic festival and all the newsroom was like, what? Just like had no idea. And so, I mean, it's just an embarrassment of how badly we're doing in this space. Um, but to your point, our, our projects are all about how do we now recognize that we're completely missing this if we, we, we don't build those ties. Knowing how to, to build those, the trust in simply partner, partnering, like why should somebody come to First Draft and be like, we want to work with you if we haven't gone and sought that out in the first place? So it's something we're really trying, trying hard on, but it's, yeah. And to the second half of your question, I, I think a lot about this. I think a lot about what is the relationship that these presses are trying to have with their audiences. And being someone that had lived in LA for five years, people were reading the black press and they were talking about it and they were critical of it as well. They weren't just taking everything in. But because it was... Uh, you, you, going after issues that were nuanced within that community, they didn't have to go through a lot of what I think happens in the New York Times, for instance, or other bi uh, bigger papers where they have to like keep explaining the context by what it, why it would be interesting for you to read this article, right? It just kind of cuts to the chase and gets to the content and and knows very clearly who the audience is. And I and I offer to sometimes when uh, newsrooms invite me in, I say, well, what is your audience and how how do you shape the content for them and about them? Um, and they don't really do this kind of work, right? And, and, and I think that that trust can be built in those ways, not, not only through uh, different identity categories, but also paying a lot more attention to what matters to the people in the community and, and, and serving news within a broader context of not just an article, but thinking about what is the... Um, array of information someone might want to see throughout the day that has sports and media and commentary and news uh, and and cultivating a community uh, of uh, an audience that is a community and I think that there that that's possible but at the same time um, journalists still feel this need to go after things that are short fast and punchy because that's how they're going to make their money if they're doing a lot of freelance work. And so, so it's a really difficult thing because there's just not a ton of funding in that other space. I, th I think we're out of time. And thank you to our panel.